This is Miriam Raftery with the East County Magazine radio show on KNSJ 89.1 FM Descanso, the network for social justice. And today, my very special guest is Joseph Roca, a candidate running for the newly redrawn 40th State Senate District seat, which currently is held by Brian Jones. Joseph is a military veteran. He's served in both the Navy and the Marine Corps working as a bomb dog handler, tracking down explosives in the Persian Gulf. I guess he's got the uh, the courage to be a politician now. And later, after obtaining his law degree as a Marine Corps captain and prosecutor, his testimony was instrumental in the Supreme Court's decision to overturn the military's don't ask, don't tell policy. And now Joseph says he's committed to justice for everyone. Full disclosure, Joseph also served as an intern here at East County, Maggie, uh, East County Magazine way back in 2008, interviewing candidates for Congress and local offices, and now he's running for one himself. He announced last year, actually, that he would run for Congress, but instead he has set his sights on the state legislature due to the redistricting. He says he's running to focus on jobs, housing, infrastructure, veterans, and climate change, among other important issues. So, Joseph, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Miriam, it's so wonderful to see you again. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we're all real proud of everything you've accomplished since, since you since you left here. So let's start by talking about how the 40th State Senate District has changed with the redistricting. Can you tell us what communities are now included in it? And, and after that, what path for victory you envision here? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so visually speaking, we start in Rainbow here in North County, make our way down East County and capture Escondido and San Marcos. And it and looks like your, your your video froze for a moment. So go ahead. I we heard Escondido, San Marcos, working its way down to. Yeah. So if you want, do you want to just start from the top? Sure. Okay. Sure. So our district, you know, to give you the visual, we start up north in Rainbow, and we make our way down north and east county. Um, we cover Fallbrook, Escondido, San Marcos, Poway, Ramona. We make our way down to um, Alpine Valley. And then we, the, what's thrown this district into, um, into the competitive realm is that it took a hard swing out to the coast all the way to University City. Um, so we nearly reached UCSD's main campus just on the other side of the five freeway. Wow, so that's a lot of new territory that, that Brian Jones has not represented before. It does still include here in East County folks, the areas of Alpine, as he mentioned, Pine Valley, Mount Laguna, but then it, it snakes, snakes north, so it no longer includes places like, you know, El Cajon or a lot of the, a lot of the meat of the district. So it, it's, it sounds like it's going to be a very interesting race. That's right, Miriam. Um, so, so just for reference, Brian won this district by only three points four years ago. Wow. And that, that was in a uh, Biden plus one. Um, well, in what would now be a Biden plus one um, mm -hmm. in what would have been a Republican registration advantage of three to four points. Mm -hmm. uh, the new district that he's drawn into, I like to say, is not the district that elected into office four years ago in that it's a Biden plus six. And it is has nearly erased the Republican registration advantage. So if at all, it is at 0 0.06, not even a full percent. Very um, interesting. So it's basically evenly divided uh, among the two major parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. Fascinating. That's right. So tell us a little bit more about your background, your ties to the district, and how you think your experiences have qualified and prepared you to serve the people of this district in the state Senate, Joseph. Yeah, so uh, I had a, a very formative and uh, challenging childhood that really led, led through into my career, um, and, uh, but I'm very proud of. Um, I think that the adversity in my life has, has given me the passion for, for justice and for service um, that, that I have today. So I, I'm second generation Mexican American. My family started in uh, Northern California, just miles away from the capital, actually, in the fields and factories of Woodland and Davis. My mother raised me until I was seven. She was a grocery store worker, but she struggled with addiction, and she lost me when I was seven. And then my father took me in in Southern California, and I've been here ever since. Uh, you know, he raised a family of five, so his own two children and his wife and myself, uh, with a truck driver's salary, which is nearly impossible nowadays. Yeah. So these... These, you know, bread and butter um, 
working family issues and the middle class have been uh, a core passion of mine since I can remember. Um, when I was 17, I had to leave the home because I came out as gay. Um, and I actually survived by working as a dishwasher. Um, I stayed in high school for my senior year. I graduated and I joined the Navy. Uh, I joined the Navy because I wanted to go to the Naval Academy to be a Marine Corps officer. I became a military police officer because they were uh, being deployed in high numbers at the time. I became a bomb dog handler because to increase my opportunities or chances to be deployed. And I went to Bahrain to get to Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So I spent two and a half years doing explosive detection in the Middle East, wow. and then um, following being accepted to the Naval Academy Preparatory School, no less, I was discharged under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, as you mentioned, I was in a case, it's a federal court case, but a federal court case that was held here in Riverside, um, uh, where I was a principal witness, and it ruled Don't Ask, Don't Tell unconstitutional. Um, it was critical to the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. There had actually been a legislative vote prior to the ruling that had failed, and then it was put back up for a vote after, and obviously now having been ruled unconstitutional, it passed. Um, for me, it was equally as important to be an example of positive out leadership um, as it was for us to be allowed to serve in the first place. So uh, yeah. I went to law school and in law school, I returned to the service, I commissioned as a Marine Corps officer, I served as a judge advocate. You know, a little bit about my, my Marine Corps bio, my first job was as a, uh, the deputy legal assistance attorney um, for, the, for Mickey West, for Mickey East, which is about 20,000 Marines. And legal assistance is basically your one-stop shop for all uh, legal issues for the Marines. Yeah, I like works. to equate it to constituent services, right? So one of the top jobs, most important jobs of a California state senator is constituent services, and it's connecting um, your constituents to the services of the state and helping lift them up. And I did that. I did that quite well. I actually earned the legal assistance attorney of the year award for 2019 and 2020 from the commandant of the Marine Corps. Um, Very from, good. Thank you. So from there, uh, during the global shutdown, I was deployed to Central America. Um, uh, and I was the subject matter expert in embassy evacuations for the seven embassies uh, that were there in Central America during the global shutdown. So that's when we were still trying to, we were still trying to move troops, but also be prepared in these more unstable countries. If any of them were to collapse, how we would ultimately have to uh, move American citizens back to the U.S. And then finally, I did my prosecution stint um, doing serious and, and uh, sensitive felony crimes. Uh, in Marine Corps prosecution. So you've really been in a lot of the world's hot spots and also got a, a lot of good legal experience, which can certainly come in handy when drafting laws. We see some where it looks like maybe someone should have had more legal experience on occasion. Yeah, no kidding. I know some people, you know, I think we get a bad rap. I certainly think that, you know, there's probably no good use for, you know, high paid corporate lawyers in public service. Um, but I think it should be distinguished that that public servant lawyers are very necessary in lawmaking. You know, you wouldn't ask, uh, you know, why there's an engineer on a on building a, a bridge, right? You would want an engineer um, to help you build a bridge. Um, I think that public servant lawyers um, are important to good uh, policy and lawmaking. Yeah. Well, speaking of policy and lawmaking, let's talk about some of the issues in the race. What ideas do you have, Joseph, to make housing more available and more affordable for, for new home buyers as well as for renters? You, you've said this would be a priority for you. Yeah, so I'm a lifelong renter, um, but I also did home, own a home in uh, my last duty station in North Carolina in Camp Lejeune. Um, so I feel like I've experienced it, um, you know, both sides of this equation. Um, I think it's equally important that we increase access to first time home buyer ownership, we know that that is the path to generational wealth in America, right? Owning property. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many communities that not only have not had access, but have been actively removed from access or, or barriers have been in place so that they can have access to uh, first to mortgages. Um, and, you know, I think that's the yeah. first place we need to start and helping get people all on the same footing. Um, with that, you know, obviously, I think we still have to have renter protections. Um, how building more housing is obviously um, key to uh, getting out of this housing crisis, but we also have to make sure that we're not just giving a windfall 
to developers to gouge and run renters into the ground, um, you know, making uh, exactly make- while taking all the parking in the neighborhood. We, we hear these you know complaints from people sometimes, and it's it's a really big challenge because it seems like no matter where you put the housing, there's often community resistance or other problems. We just saw a judge deny, uh, tell the supervisors they had to undo a big housing development out in Otai because it was a high fire danger and they had failed to consider what this would mean you know, for everybody trying to evacuate on that roadway. And then when they try to put it in urban areas with maybe a, a high rise and say a suburban area, then people think it takes away community character or parking. So it's really a really difficult, I think one of the difficult most difficult challenges that legislators face. And yet we have this housing shortage. It's really a crisis. So many people, young people, especially just priced out of the market completely. Absolutely. Um, You know, there's, there's no question that we are decades behind in our housing uh, building and um, but there's definitely an appetite. There's, there's a lot of of activism, social justice activism um, and community leadership um, to, to get through this. And I think that every time we run into a barrier, like the ones that you mentioned, those are just opportunities for us to factor those into our next project so that they can stick and be successful and, and increase the housing market. Um, you know, and I, obviously reducing red tape, which is heavy in Sacramento, um, is something that I'm very passionate about that would go a long way in solving mo- most of our policy issues. And it's something that I think as a Marine Corps officer, um, you know, I would be well equipped to do. Very good. Uh, San Diego County has one of the highest homeless rates, if not the highest homeless rate in the entire nation. And it's only gotten worse with the pandemic, with more people losing their homes. What's your approach uh, or approaches, since it sometimes is a multifaceted problem, to keeping people from losing their homes in the first place and then to helping those who are homeless get off the streets? So I think that You know, one thing is there needs to be better communication between all levels of government. So the state, uh, the the county and the city, so that we're not wasting money, right? Nothing's more frustrating to taxpayers than seeing money wasted. So a better communication between all levels of government. At the core of all of our issues is going to be housing. We're going to come back to housing uh, quite a bit today. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously addressing that that housing crisis and shortage uh, a lot of people who are homeless are homeless because, you know, they just missed a mortgage payment or they missed a rental payment. Uh, you know, they got sick. They ran out of paid sick leaves. They live alone. They have a family. Um, you know, these are compounding issues where, you know, good, hardworking Americans who have paid their bills and who had done everything right come on hard times and then suddenly find themselves first living in their cars and then living on the streets. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a level of compassion and empathy that needs to be had um, while I understand that the state is frustrated and there's a level of action that needs to be had. Uh, otherwise, the taxpayers are going to continue to be frustrated with us. Um, I think that, you know, connecting, continuing to move these mobile teams in the direction of mobile teams where we are deploying, um, you know, health care services, uh, mental health services and drug addiction services um, and connecting the homeless population to the services the state already provides that aren't being utilized to their full potential is important. Um, And then lastly, just, I think we could do more uh, too large a population of uh, our homeless are veterans. And I think that there's more that we could do in the transition phase of our service members to civilian life that would prevent this. That Um, was my next question actually, was as a veteran yourself, what role do you see the state having to make sure that veterans, especially those recently returning vets coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq, many of them had very long deployments, uh, you know, that they're getting the resources and help that they need, not only the homeless vets, but the ones that may have other issues. Yeah, so I'm, this is something I'm, I'm really, that I feel very strongly about um, and I love to talk about, which is I think California needs to do more for our active duty service members. I think we need to build more rapport and better rapport with our service members. You know, uh, I did serve on that joint deployment to Central America. So, and as a dog handler, we're trained, we're trained by and our classmates are uh, from every service branch in Lackland. Um, and so I've served with every branch of the military and I'll tell you the one thing that you know across all service branches is uh, a, a service member from Texas will be the first to tell you that he's from Texas, right? And he'll be the first to tell you all the programs and all the benefits they get for being active duty in their state. Hmm. 
Um, and that's something that I think would go a long way in this state, especially as we see radicalization creeping up in this state and in yeah. our district. Um, and as we see, um, you know, more uh, radicalization within the ranks and within our veteran community, if there was a stronger relationship with our active duty service members, it would go a long way. So quickly, I'll just give you some examples. One, um, you know, in Texas, uh, service members, they get free tuition. Um, that allows them to give their spouses or their children their GI Bill, which means that that's creating generational wealth, right? Good um, idea. That's uh, kind of a federal issue. Or is this something that the state can do? No, that's something Texas does. So oh, Texas okay. is, this, is giving their service members free tuition. And because the federal government nice. already gives a service member their GI Bill, which is a full ride, they are able to roll over that GI Bill to a family member, an immediate family member. Um, and so that helps that go a long way. Um, you know, we, we've seen here, particularly in San Diego, I think we have all been very alarmed and, and, and upset to find out how much food insecurity there is within the lower ranks of our service members. So, you know, targeting as a state, the employment of spouses would go a long way in helping these families be able Absolutely. to, to um, you know, uh, to have um, a living, to, to, to be able to um, provide for their families. And so just those little things, I think there's a long way that we can go in, in creating a little bit stronger of a relationship with our active duty service members. Very good. Um, and let's see. You've mentioned you wanted to focus on creating good paying jobs and including here in the San Diego region. Can you a little elaborate a little bit on what your plan might include? Yeah, so that's actually exactly where we left off. So there is a difference between employment and gainful employment, right? Yeah. So uh, a person who has two to three jobs and never sees their family, has no paid sick leave, has no vacation days, has no health care benefits, is employed, but they're not gainfully employed. Right. Flipping um, hamburgers and driving Uber is, is just not going to support a family in this economy. Um, so people should be able to have a single job um, that, that provides for their family. Um, and you know, that's, that would be a focus of mine in the state. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of unions and I would be a cha champion for unions in the state. Um, they built the middle class. My family obviously once made their way up to the middle class and enjoyed a, a middle class that was very different from the one that we have now, if at all. Yeah, your dad uh, was a trucker. Was he a teamster? My dad did, uh, he was a member of the union when he was younger. Um, mm -hmm. um, and my mother was a grocery store worker um, and then grandparents, farmers and, and factory workers. So, yeah. uh, you know, these were good, hard, honest jobs that, that could provide for a family and uh, either hardly can or cannot anymore. And so we need to fix that. Um, and the hollowing out of the middle class is also at the core of a lot of our woes in the state and at the federal, at, at, the, at a national level, right? As we see rich people get richer and working class families work themselves more into the ground with no light in sight, that creates frustration and it also divides us. So, um, so uh, yeah, worker protections, rebuilding the middle class and looking out for those working class families, making sure that opportunity, the opportunity that allowed me to be the first person to go to community college, college, law school. And while there's a history of service in my family, the first person to become an officer um, that I want to make sure that that opportunity exists for uh, our next generation. Yeah, those are very worthy goals. Infrastructure is another priority that you have listed on your website, Joseph. Our region has a lot of infrastructure needs from obviously things like improving mass transit, gridlock on ending the gridlock on Highway 52, but also protecting the public from, we're researching a, a story now on two aging dams, one at El Capitan, one at Lake Hodges, both of which are very near active earthquake faults that are yes, capable of that. Yeah, we had one right near there the other day and it's capable of about a 7.8 quake. Um, and these are both ranked as extremely dangerous by the state, both in terms of the condition of these old earthen dams that are crumbling away and how many people would die if they were ever to, you know, to break. Uh, so given that backdrop, I, I would like to ask what you think should be priority projects for our region, and would you fight specifically to get some funding to start repairing these dams, especially El Capitan? I think there's a little bit of a, a plan in progress for Hodges now, but nothing on the horizon that I've heard of for El Capitan, which is the worst of all of them. 
out here in, in Lakeside, but if it flooded, it would basically wipe out Mission Valley, you know, uh, yeah. all the way down. Yeah, so in the congressional run, uh, I was a strong supporter of the infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, no, no less. Mm -hmm. And that has obviously unlocked a, a tremendous amount of res resources and funds to uh, the states. And that will make its way down to the county and the city, but not if we don't fight for it, right? So mm -hmm. I would absolutely fight for resources for the district as hard as I've fought for everything else. Um, and I, you know, I'd be a great advocate for the community up in Sacramento. As far as priorities go, you know, um, I, I, they're equal. I mean, it's as equally important for you to be able to get to your children and pick them up from school as it is to make sure that you, uh, you know, your house doesn't get washed away. Um, you know, something that as a Marine is very important to me is listening to experts and leaders. Um, and so again, back to that communication piece between the city, the county and the state, um, you know, we, I'm sure they're getting engineering uh, reports about all of these projects and in which are uh, pose a greater threat to the community and those should be prioritized. Okay, thank you. You've mentioned common sense solutions to tackle climate change. This is one area where uh, I believe you and the incumbent Ryan Jones probably differ sharply, at least some years ago when I interviewed him, he, he was a climate change denier, basically, did not think it was real or did not think it was that man was contributing to it. I don't know if he's softened or changed on that through the years, but I would like to know what, to, what solutions you would support to tackle climate change and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And that said, without imposing undue burdens on those who can least afford it, uh, an example being, uh, for example, the proposed mileage tax where a lot of the rural residents could be stuck paying $1,000 a year and yet not benefiting from the mass transit project. So it's another thorny issue, but obviously it's a global concern. Um, what are the answers that, that you would support? Yeah, so last I checked, I believe that Brian was rated 8% uh, for his legislative record on the environment. Um, he also prides himself on being a supporter of firefighters. Uh, you cannot be uh, a climate change denier and be a supporter of firefighters. Um, our state uh, is facing, um, you know, these increasingly dangerous um, and larger fires every yeah. single year. I was talking to a firefighter, an older firefighter leader recently, and he told me that, you know, when he was a kid, you almost wished that one day you could be a part of a big fire just to sort of cut your teeth and earn your credibility within the fire community. And nowadays, um, we lose more firefighters to suicide than we do to the fires because of the back-to-back -back rapid deployment um, cycles that they are facing. And, and Cal yeah. Southern as California- As well as lung damage, a lot of them are dying of cancer because of all the exposure to repeated really large fires and all of the chemicals and all of the smoke. That's exactly that they, right. And, and they're they, having you know. to fight those things out. And, and, and the, the threshold for them proving that their cancers are related to the fires are too high. So that's a separate issue that I'm, I, I, I'm very supportive of. Um, so, you know, and it also affects our senior citizens, right? So as every year our, um, our winters get colder and our summers get hotter, particularly our summers in a state that really wasn't built to have air conditioning. You know, Southern California in particular, mm -hmm. San Diego, a lot of our homes don't have air conditioning because it was never hot enough to need that here. Um, and so we have senior citizens who it becomes a, a life or death issue. Um, so as far as the common sense, you know, solutions go, I think that, you know, th these things have to be prioritized as commitments to our communities. Mm -hmm. And first and foremost, to your point of who's carrying the burden, corporations have to pay their fair share. We are the fifth, we're the fifth largest economy in the world, last time I checked, and uh, corporations are just not paying their fair share. I mean, in fact, for a while, they weren't even reporting what their carbon emissions were. I think that uh, the capital just was successful in passing a law to ensure that. So. Um, so, you know, I think that's where we start, um, and, uh, and we go from there. I think there's a lot of things that we can do. Say again? What about, um, making sure that we retain the incentives for solar? We're seeing some efforts up in Sacramento to erode that by the utility companies right now, uh, to erode the profits that a homeowner could make by selling their solar back to the grid, which of course is one of the big incentives for getting solar other than the altruistic motives. 
Well, and that goes just right back to corporate greed, right? So um, the the electric company is saying that they're not getting enough money for the power while they're also still shirking and ignoring their responsibility to the crumbling infrastructure of the power grid, which they refuse, just keep pushing off and off saying it's too expensive while it gets more expensive. Um, and, you know, that that's, a, a, you know, another example of that is the, the oil and gas companies where... Um, where we're seeing them having skyrocketing profits while gas is going up. So is gas going up because it needs to go up or because we're allowing these companies to continue to uh, run us dry? Yeah. Um, On another issue, Joseph, you've been a champion for equality, having, as we mentioned earlier, won your own hard-fought battle to end discrimination in the military, military against LGBTQ soldiers. I wonder how that experience has impacted your, you know, your life and your goal of fighting for equal rights for everybody in an era when, as you mentioned, we're seeing a rise in hate groups, including right here in East County, where we've seen, you know, attacks and discrimination on not only people in the gay community, but also Jews, Black people, Asians, Latinos, uh, and immigrants, just to name a few, within the last couple of years here, synagogues defaced, you know, um, what what are you, what's your take on that? Uh, my take is that you know first and foremost, what drives me absolutely nuts is the inability of people who are in positions of leadership um, being unable to condemn these actions. Right? It is the absolute bare minimum that these so-called leaders could do, and for political reasons, which if you start digging into that, why would you think there would be political backlash for you to denounce? neo-Nazism or, or a radicalization, that should be equally alarming. So anyhow, that's where it starts, right? And obviously that's something that I'm not afraid to do. Uh, when we met, I think I hadn't done it yet, but I was uh, close to um, having taken a national stage in, in fighting for equal rights for LGBTQ plus service members. And that was on a national stage. It was post a George Bush administration and uh, a, a chairman of the Joint Chiefs that had said that homosexuality was immoral. Um, so, you know, I've, I've, I was, what, 10 years younger, had no team, and was exposed to the wrath of the darkest, you know, parts of the internet um, for, uh, for quite some time. So, so you've ten- experienced that, sort of being a target of hate right. speech you know, and so probably threats years, yourself. Exactly. So 10 years later, and now with a team, uh, and in, you know, having been a Marine Corps officer and all of that, I'll tell you, you know, skin is thick as a rhino. Um, you know, we, we, frankly, we have had numerous death threats in the congressional here in the district. Um, oh, nothing terrible. has or will stop me from, um, you know, my commitment and dedication to service in the community. Um, you know, and that extends to everyone because it's, When these things occur to you, it doesn't make you try to find people like you to protect you and them. It makes it it builds your empathy towards any shared experience with other communities. So, you know, we've seen this hate towards the the Arab community, the Muslim community, the Jewish community. We this district has picked up a large API community, um, which due to the previous leadership um, at the highest levels of the way that they racialized and and mishandled COVID um, created uh, uh, more hate within uh, or against the Asian community. Yeah, um, and, and so, disabled people, we should mention, there's even been, you know, hate, even the past president mocking a disabled reporter, uh, just that's right. shocking, I think. Yeah, so, you know, I think you can't make up for lived experience. Um, this is something that I've shown, you know, um, I have experienced the darkest sides of this. It is something that I am passionate about and I've dedicated my life to. And I I would love to put that spirit and that fight um, to the service of this community in in the Capitol. Okay, and protecting the rights of everyone. As we do this interview, we are still in a global pandemic due to COVID-19 with yet another surge of a new variant, Omicron. There's been a lot of controversy over just how far the state should go with things like vaccine mandates, mask mandates, um, you know, pitting, protecting public health against personal freedoms. There's also been controversies about, you know, shutdowns of business, how many, how long, uh, which obviously shutdowns probably saved lives, but also caused 
economic harm to a lot of mom and pop businesses and even some larger companies. So I would like to ask Joseph, what are your views about how best to balance those competing needs if they should be balanced and how you would, how you believe we should be addressing uh, the pandemic and any new needs that it may, the pandemic itself may have created? So I feel like we could spend an hour on this at minimum, yeah. right? Um, but briefly, yeah. you know, my my brain is firing off in a million different directions. I think that yeah, apologies, it's kind of a complex question. But. No, that's quite all right, and and I, you know, it's something uh, that I'm excited to to address. So um, I think that first and foremost, we've learned a lot of lessons from the pandemic, and I think it's important to carry those on with us and not to forget them. I think it's also important to evolve with the pandemic. Um, so restrictions that were put in place two years ago now um, may not be practical uh, two years later uh, based on the new variant that we're dealing with. Right. Um, Plus we have vaccines and things we didn't have, tools we didn't have in the very that's beginning. That's exactly that right. At least can help fight it. Yeah. And something, you know, I think that we have to really keep an eye on is, again, back to the radicalization, uh, this, 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 this faction's um, very keen ability to find stress and then direct it uh, against, uh, direct it in ways that divide us, right? So the politicization, difficult word, of the pandemic has been mm -hmm. very disheartening, right? It really should yeah. have been a 9-11 where we really come together as a country to, uh, to lift each other out of this very difficult time. And uh, unfortunately, you know, due to certain forces, uh, it, it was manipulated just to divide us further. Um, but I think the good thing that we've seen out of these challenges in the last two years is that it's brought attention to um, things that we had been either willfully ignoring or ignorant to. Um, and that's a lot of the struggles of our, um, of our underserved and underrepresented populations, um, of working class people, things like paid sick leave, um, things like childcare, yeah. things like um, so important. Yeah, um, technology in the home for school kids who suddenly are, are you know had to study broad, at home. Quite exactly often. right. Broadband, mm -hmm. internet, um, and I keep thinking there's something that keeps escaping my mind. But you know, access to healthcare, um, and and who is an essential worker, right? And that's something I'm very very glad of is that finally. You know, grocery store workers and nurses uh, and teachers are getting their day, um, but yeah. but you know, sending a tweet out or saying that again, it goes back to the firefighter things that I mentioned earlier. It's like saying you support these communities, but doing absolutely nothing legislatively in the in the capital to ensure that they receive the protections and dignity that they deserve is not enough. And so that's something that I you know is very important to me. Okay, uh, speaking of healthcare, which is of course so important. A bill that would have provided universal health care for all Californians died yesterday. Uh, you know, the show is taped, but yesterday as we're taping it, without coming to a vote in the full assembly up in Sacramento after the author had to withdraw it because there was not quite enough support for passage. So I would like to ask Joseph, do you think that health care for all Californians is a goal we should work toward? And if so, is it affordable? It goes to, I guess, both, you know, is it a good idea? And it, B, is it something that uh, is practical economically? So again, on this one, I would lean on experts and scientists and doctors in the community. However, uh, you know, broadly speaking, you know, it is a, a part of our democratic platform that healthcare is a universal right. Uh, and so working towards that goal, I think, is important. And I think it's exciting and encouraging that we saw such a bold um, attempt here. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's something that's very important. When we, when, we see the, when we see the surplus that we have in our, um, as a state, but we see, continue to live with these, uh, with these issues, faith is being lost in our, in our system. And so we need to have, we have to take more bold actions. Piecemealing things is just not moving fast enough. We need to take more bold actions to show the results to the state so that the state can continue trusting us, you know, it's a relationship and, and that's very important. 
Um, so I think that this is encouraging and that we will see more proposals on how to increase access to and make healthcare affordable in the state. Um, and, you know, there's, there's things that while this is dead for now, I hope that we prioritize um, other things rapidly, such as, you know, decreasing the cost of prescription medications in the state for our seniors uh, and, and our low income people. Um, so I think we're headed in the right direction. I think there were too many questions. Uh, again, as we talked about with COVID and other policies uh, such as housing, I hope that we learn from uh, where we fell short so that we can come back with a more perfect product in the future. You know, there were a lot of questions as to where the revenue was gonna come for this bill, um, whether people were gonna be able to stay on their private healthcare if they wanted to, um, and whether the state had the infrastructure and the staffing, which is something that is endlessly frustrating to me as a, you know, a service member or something yeah. in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the federal government system, when you see big, big systems that um, implement programs, but don't have the staffing and resources to actually do them effectively. So did we, or do we have, um, or what are we doing to create a infrastructure, a human infrastructure yeah. prepared to take on a single payer uh, statewide system? Yeah, staffing in the middle of the pandemic is an issue. It seems like in every industry, I just went through it with trying to get emergency care for my dog and you can't get appointments anywhere for, for weeks. You know, it's just affecting, it seems like every aspect of our lives right now. So maybe yeah. it was just a particularly difficult year to try to get this through, but perhaps yeah, in the future that would be different. I'm sorry to hear about your pet, um, but, but, you know, that, so that goes to, you know, something we focus on a lot as service members is second and third order effects, right? Mm -hmm. We like to say good intentions, bad idea. It is very important to me, particularly as a legislator, if I'm so lucky to serve as, is that we're not creating more problems than we're solving just to, you know, have, you know, an exciting legislative piece that we can put our name to and say we did a thing, right? We, we have right. to- The devil's in the details, basically. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, on, it's interesting that on a day when we're all talking about whether or not we could have afforded a universal health care bill or not, your opponent, uh, State Senator Brian Jones, came out with a video that he sent out to all of his constituents this morning, uh, arguing that the budget surplus should be divided up and $1,125 should just be sent to every Californian. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I mean, he represents a party that just allowed the child tax credit, which is $600 a month um, to expire. And that we are now seeing is a uh, crypto At the federal level, we should clarify, right. but yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is causing much distress within families. Um, so uh, I'm not entirely sure how he thinks that $1,100 is going to solve institutional um, short falls of the state. Um, and I, you know, I think it's, it's just, it's just one more way to take the easy way out when faced with very difficult issues. Um, there you go. Um, what else would you like our readers to know about you and your candidacy for the 40th State Senate District uh, that I maybe haven't asked, Joseph? And um, can you tell readers where they can find more information on your candidacy? And by the way, viewers, listeners, if you are tuning in late, we are speaking with Joseph Roca, who is a Democratic candidate running in the newly redrawn 40th State Senate District, currently represented by Brian Jones, but it's shifting westward, so it's going to have less of East County and more of the, of the coastal communities, uh, it, uh, as well as portions of North County. Yeah, so uh, readers or listeners. Um, it's all of them, really. It'll be on our website, on our radio show. We'll have a video posted online, too. Exactly. So you all can learn more. Uh, hopefully, you know, join in, learn more, uh, support us at rocha for senatecom R-O-C-H-A for senatecom um, You know, again, we've been talking a lot just about empathy and lived experience. And I think that those are things that you can't make up for. Um, I've dedicated my life to service. I've gone through some tremendously difficult challenges and emerged stronger for it. Um, I'm very proud of them. Um, and I'm not afraid of anything and I don't let things get in my way of uh, helping my community. So, you know, something we, we do have a, a, 
we do have a more moderate conservative uh, base here in our district. I have lived in and thrived in conservative spaces all my life, having just left the Marine Corps as a captain and a prosecutor. Um, you know, I am a member of the VFW and the American Legion here, and um, a I'll just say a certain someone came up to me and, and he said he said Do you know how Do you know how some of the older vets uh, refer to you here? And I was like, No, I how and I kind of <laughs> I wasn't entirely sure and I just kind of held my breath and they said they said uh they they say about you he might be a democrat but he's a marine um and that's <laughs> that's the confidence that we have built over the past seven months on our campaign uh in the district where um we've led with common sense we've led with unity we've led with uh focusing on on the kitchen table issues how do we help you provide for your family where where are the services falling short of helping you um, get ahead? And I think that um, you know, we've seen it really resonate. Uh, our district covers Miramar, which I would be tremendously proud to represent and make sure that the sailors and Marines and, and employees there have everything they need from the state to succeed. Um, and uh, you know, we have fantastic universities and community colleges, um, which I was lucky enough to attend our our community college and our uh, university systems here in the region and so uh yeah i invite people along this is uh this is a textbook battleground uh um um uh, race now right so it's a even even registration republican democrats um with a large independent population that leans democrats and my task is to go out there prove myself earn that trust and, and i'm confident that i can do that and I think it would go a long way for this region to elect a Latino LGBTQ plus veteran of the Navy and the Marine Corps um, in, uh, you know, in our region, our state, in, in our country. Um, you know, I think this is the future of the Democratic Party. We cannot be the party of major cities on the coast. We have to start showing our ability to lead and serve in spaces that are more moderate and conservative uh, and change what people think of as Democratic leadership. Well, I want to thank you very much, Joseph, for taking the time to join us today on the East County Magazine radio show on KNSJ 89.1 FM, Descanso, the network for social justice.